So if my clock is correct, it's 3.45. That means, that, that means I'm supposed to start, right? Welcome to my talk, the Scrum Master's Guide to Team Dynamics. Um, my first question to all of you, I mean, there must be a reason why you're here. Who of you is actually already a Scrum Master? Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm a little bit frightened now, so I didn't expect so many hands to go up. How many of you want to become Scrum? Oh, a few, okay. Uh, how many of you are team members? Oh, still a few. Who is none of all of that? Mm. Oh, wow. <laughs> Very good one. Okay, good. So, um, this talk is especially uh, in the focus of the Scrum Mastery for Scrum Masters, yeah? But based on my personal journey, based on my own experience, based on uh, research I've done for that. But um, you can interrupt me at all the time. No, that's not me. Uh, you can interrupt me anytime, ask questions or add your experience to what I'm telling here because a lot of that is based on knowledge I have created in my research when I did my PhD thesis and even before that and that's years back so but it helped me a lot to understand what it really means to become a scrum master when I was a scrum master myself to become a coach also because scrum mastery and coaching is definitely connected somehow yeah I think we can agree on that I hope we can agree on that uh, later on I became a Scrum trainer, so I'm trying to give my experience, my knowledge about Scrum, about coaching, about team dynamics, like psychology, etc. to people like you here in the room now. Uh, down here you can see what I'm interested in besides Scrum agility. So if you really want to have a serious conversation with me outside, talk to me about that. <laughs> <laughs> That's my favorite topic. So, uh, that's the company I'm working for, it's Chip ID. We are focusing on training, scaling and coaching. We have the booth outside, my colleagues are also there to help you with any questions you have around. Trainings, whatever, yeah, less. We are also hosting the fans of less section here, large scale scrum. So if you're interested in that, also go, uh, good to go to our booth. Now to the topic. Um, what I will tell you, I already said, is a lot, a lot of it is based on what I've done in, in this uh, activity years back when I wrote my PhD thesis with this nice title. Yeah. And when I wanted to start with this PhD thesis, it was, it was the year 2001. Yeah. I wanted to start with that in 2001. Why I'm saying that? I mean, we all know the Agile Manifesto came out in 2001. I went to the professors at the university and said, hey, I want to write a PhD thesis about agility. Are you, are you going to support me? Are you going to help me with that? I saw so many confused faces yeah, at different universities. What is this guy talking about? Agility, agile, yeah, writing about that, a PhD thesis. Sure, you can do that, but you have to pay me money for that. So it took me two years to find a professor here in Austria, in Austria. Uh, to support that, and that's when it took off, and when, uh, when I started to write it. it. It was a combination of, of course, economics a little bit, about agility, about the methods, frameworks, etc., psychology and sociology. Yeah? And the psychological part is part of this talk today. So, um, these are sources I've taken. So there is something uh, based on the research from the University of Paderborn, Maybe you know the, uh, the book Leading Teams by Heckman. He was a Harvard professor. Lucky and Latham, goal setting theory. So the, uh, the, uh, those two guys are the fathers of the goal setting theory, I would say. And also the University of Zurich, uh, Professor Ulrich, Social Psychology. So these are pretty much yeah, the basis for that, what I've taken. Of course, there were more articles, more books, but these are the main points. We're talking about team dynamics. So what is a team? We are talking very often about teams, even if we are probably not teams yet, if they are just work groups, so to say. I like this uh, definition of a team. A 
team is a group of people linked in a common purpose. I think that's very important. Yeah, we all have to have a common purpose, a common goal to call ourselves a team. Yeah, human teams are especially appropriate for conducting tasks that are high in complexity. We can discuss that. Yeah, I mean we can do also simple tasks as a team, of course, but. They are especially appropriate, that's in this definition. Let's have a look at that a little bit later in my talk. The two main challenges when it comes down to teamwork are motivation and coordination. Yeah. In social psychology it goes down to motivational losses, motivational gains, and coordinational losses and coordination gains. Uh, so that means motivation each individual in the team should be motivated to work for this purpose, to work for this task. But even with that, it's not guaranteed that the outcome will be positive because there are also coordination aspects that need to be considered. Yeah, you'll see some of them in this talk. Um, I said I wanted to start to write my PhD thesis in 2001. So that's, if I do the math correctly, 18 years ago. Yeah. And that's and I've done my research and studied sexual psychology. I haven't finished it, so I have to confess I, uh, I haven't finished the study, but I was very interested in that and I've done my studies before that. So some of the theories which are still valid nowadays, they're from the 60s and the 70s and even a little bit of that sometimes. Two of them are coming pretty soon. First of all, I mean you're here at this front gathering. I think you all heard these hyper-productive uh, sales pitches about Scrum. We are creating high-performance teams and stuff like that. Yeah? I don't like that so much. Even if I'm a certified Scrum frame, I'm, I'm with Scrum a while. So yes, we want to have high performance, but this sales pitch is not nothing I really like. Because what does team performance really mean? What is the potential team performance? Performance of a team if available resources are used optimally. But how to use them optimally? That's of course uh, once again a part of the Scrum Mastery, of Scrum Master's job. Yeah? What that means? We'll see. Self-organization, another term we hear a lot. Yeah? Some of my statements are a little bit controversial. You will see that in a minute. Self-organization. I like that. This is coming also. You can find that on Wikipedia. I just copied it from there. Usually, uh, actually, it's coming from the social scientists, scientists, and it's coming from the term spontaneous order. Yeah. Self organization, uh, organization is a process where some form of overall order arises from local <coughs> interactions. Nice. Let's look at the spontaneous order thing. Spontaneous order is the spontaneous emergence of order out of seeming chaos. I think there's one important aspect in this one, in this statement, in this sentence. It's the order out of seeming chaos. Yeah? So that means for self-organization, very often, I mean, I'm not sure if you've heard that Scrum or Agility looks like chaos or it is chaos. Yeah? We want to get out of that, it's not chaos, it's a lot of structure, it seems like chaos. That's what we need to be aware of. That's also what we should yeah, highlight and make explicit. One of my uh, statements about self-organization. I personally believe every team is self-organized. What does that mean? If, there, if you have a self-organized team, if they are allowed, the team is allowed to find their ways to reach a goal, to reach a sprint goal, for example, in a scrum environment, in a sprint. And they decide, we want to have a team leader. Is that still self-organization? Is that still a self-organized team? Who would say yes? Okay, who would say no? Nobody. Hey, cool. You agree with me with this statement, actually. I mean, there is a difference in the early days of Scrum and even before Scrum. Nobody was talking about self-organization, it was about self-management. And I think that's the more important aspect. A team should be self-managed, not self-organized, because every team is self-organized. The self-management aspect is the important part of it, in my uh, opinion. That's the paradigm shift we have in Scrum. So, 
teams are allowed to manage themselves. There is no team leader, there is no role for that anymore. They can decide to have a team leader. That's not a problem. Yeah. It's probably what somebody would not like to see, but if they can work like that very well, good. Not a problem. It's about the outcome. Yeah. Self-management. That's the definition I found for that. A self-managed team is a group of employees that are uh, responsible and accountable for all or most aspects of producing a product or delivering a service. All or most aspects. If we go back to Scrum again, I mean, what's the team not responsible for? What's the team not doing? The development team, I have to say. Sorry? Hiring. Hiring, maybe, yeah. Could be done by line management or somebody else, yeah. Any other aspect of the development team is not doing it themselves. Yeah, prioritizing the backlog. Who is doing that? Product owner. The product owner. And we have also another team term in Scrum, that's the Scrum team. So if we talk about the Scrum team, if they are self-managed again, the product owner is part of the Scrum team, so it, uh, but here it, it, it's compatible with this definition again, right? So, team performance, we want to produce something. I said already, we have very often this sales pitch, Scrum is producing high performance teams, you know, high performance teams. Um, if we go back, like I said, to the 60s and 70s, uh, 70s yeah, theory of cultural, he continued his research in the 70s. There are two theories that came up back then. One is the theory of, and I apologize, I still don't know how to pronounce this name correctly, Sachong, maybe, yeah, this guy over there, and the theory of opera. So Chong said, presence of others leads to dominant reaction or the hindering of non-dominant reaction. That's the social facilitation theory. Yeah? And Cochrane said, the presence of others is associated with rating. That's the evaluation, apprehension model. Um, what's in the social facilitation theory? One important factor of that is people, if they are observed yeah, by others, they feel some kind of arousal. Yeah? And that can lead to improvement of on performance for simple tasks. But for complex tasks, it can be the opposite. So, it impairs performance on complex tasks. Now in Scrum we have the situation, there is a role called Scrum Master and I saw so many hands going up and that was the reason why I said I'm frightened a little bit because I'm confronting you now with a theory, with this uh, theory where it says if team members, if the team is observed, they don't do too well on complex tasks. Product development, software development. We always, we very often say this is in the complex environment, in the complex, uh, complex range. It's complex tasks. So if what happens now, if a scrum master observes a development team, what they are doing, just to help them to get better, and increases the level of arousal, based on the theory. <coughs> what would that mean? Can you read here? They are doing a simple task. And they're probably focusing on a simple task and the more complex tasks slow down. Yeah? The performance goes down. This is somehow for me when I wrote when I when I started working with Scrum and I knew this theory before that. When I started working with Scrum, so the Scrum has observed the team and I know this theory that it was a contradiction for me. So I should them to get uh, help them to get better to increase performance probably but if I observe them on complex tasks I reduce performance so what to do now should I not observe as a scrum master what could be a solution to that scrum values scrum values scrum values yeah how do you mean that Team knows that they can be open about how they feel. Yeah. They can raise questions. They can tell you about impediments. Um, yeah. Maybe that won't hinder them, then, and this effect won't take place. 
it goes in that direction. That's exactly the point. Because it's not always like that, that's a theory. Uh, and it's connected to this evaluation apprehension model, yeah? the lever of arousal. Um, arousal may be modulated. This is the key, sta uh, the key statement in here. That means we could uh, enhance or impair the performance by our behavior, by the setup of our structure, by uh, being more open or more safe in our environment we are working in there. We hear very often this term psychological safety, for example. Yeah? Our failure culture is better. If we know it's not about rating anymore, it's not about the evaluation, then we can turn things around. But in a typically hierarchical environment, that's hard to achieve. That's almost impossible to achieve because our variables in our system, in our organization, they tell us something differently. We are used to it differently. That means we really need to change the organization, the setup, the entire system. And that's one of the main problems I see very often in organizations. We work on Scrum Mastery. Yeah? We work uh, as a Scrum Master. I myself did that. I work with the team. Yeah? And the team gets better and better and we agree to everything. Then somebody from the outside, from the other part of the organization comes in. And we fall back into this habit of hierarchical uh, interaction. Right? of being evaluated, of feeling like being evaluated. It's just a feeling. It doesn't have to be the real thing, but the feeling alone is enough that we fall back into this slowing down, into this non-performance. It means as a Scrum Master, I need to be able to observe these signals within a system as well. So that's why I've chosen these two uh, models. I mean, there are many more, there are way more, and there are follow-ups and subsequent research on that, but they were for me a little bit of a challenge when I became a Scrum Master. How can I connect these things to observing a team, helping a team to become better, right? Unfortunately, I have only 30 minutes, so I can't go too, too deep into it, yeah? And I have more than 40 slides, I need to figure out which one to skip, yeah? So, yeah. Um, let's go to the more obvious stuff. Team performance influencing factors. I mean, size, we talk a lot about size. We have self-organized teams in Scrum, as we call them. I call them self-managed teams. Three to nine people. Team structure, communication uh, structure. They all influence performance, of course. How? There is a myth, <clears throat> and the myth is that the optimal team size is four to five people. That's based on research Mr. Hackman has done, and he has written about it in his book, Leading Teams. And he figured out, based on his research, that the optimal team size is for self-managed teams, 4.6. So who wants to be the 0.6? Yeah. I mean, in an interview he said his preferred team size is 6 people. Yeah. If you go back to the Roman military, so cohorts, the smallest self-managed uh, um, parts of the military, of the army there, was 8. This was cohort. So that's when the, com uh, the complexity of communications on is not too high. Um, the reality tells us the team size is not all. It's not always the case that smaller teams are better. Yeah? In Scrum, we follow a certain purpose. In the Scrum environment, three to nine is good, but not even in such an environment we can tell for sure that three to nine is the right size. It really heavily depends on the tasks to be performed. In larger teams, and that's based on the uh, research done in the at the University of Baltimore, if tasks are more complex and we need more specialization in a team, then the larger teams become more effective and efficient. Which again sounds like a contradiction to what we know in Scrum and what we teach in Scrum. Yeah? But that's the reality. So Scrum is not a silver bullet. Maybe you have heard the sentence, yeah? Scrum is good in certain situations, in certain environments. But in other environments, in other situations, we should be able to figure out that a different setup, a different scenario makes more sense. Yeah? That's part of Scrum Mastery. So Scrum Mastery, for, uh, for me personally, goes beyond Scrum. It's not just Scrum. <laughs> Larger teams, they have advantages and disadvantages, of course. Advantages, you can have more skills, more domain knowledge, etc. 
higher risk of conflict is a disadvantage, motivation losses, which are important yeah, for performance, might be a risk that you can face in larger teams more easily than in small ones. I'll let you take it. I mean, you can download this slides uh, anyway, so. So, team structure. Another set of influences on, on team performance is the so-called role differentiation, the status differentiation, and the communication structure. Communication structure is probably well known. Roles, yeah, we say we have no roles in teams, or you can see. Uh, and we have also status differentiation. Even in development teams and scrum teams, even there, we can't get rid of that. That's part of our yeah, genetic code, I would say, probably. So, starting point. What we share in a team as a team member, and all the team members share, is we are team members. Yeah? That's the same for everybody in the team. Sounds obvious, but don't underestimate this, because that means they belong together somehow. Yeah? They work for the same purpose, for the same goal. This is also, uh, but we also need to consider that still, if the team is in the foreground, each individual counts as an individual. Yeah? And nobody is the same as the other, even if you're a team person. I mean, also obvious, but very important. Um, yeah, let's go, uh, let's go one step further. Role and status differentiation, what I've listed in the previous slide before that. The expected behavior of a person is very often connected to its position or role within a team. Even if you don't have explicit role, roles, there are still implicit roles. So we expect from people who have a specialization in, let's say, testing, that they behave like a tester. Yeah. We put them in a box. Yeah. You have heard about biases, uh, I guess, uh, at the last conference uh, I've done a talk about biases. It's heavily connected to that. We have prejudices for that. Yeah. And if we have prejudices, people not follow the prejudices. That's an interesting observation. Maybe you have seen that before. Behavior. There are two, uh, behavior is related to the relationship and also to the task, of course. Yeah. I'll skip the status for the moment. You have heard about that probably. Homogeneous teams, heterogeneous teams. Which teams are better? Homogeneous or heterogeneous? Who prefers homogeneous teams? Nobody. Who prefers heterogeneous teams? Seriously, it's the same again. It's not that one or the other is better, definitely not. It's depending on the situation once again. And if you go back to this research, what these universities have done and all the students and professors there, um, we have a set of general skills, task-related skills, general characteristics of a person and of the personality. All that comes together when we talk about homogeneity or heterogeneity. And advantages of a homogeneous team is that there is a better kind of co cooperation, easier cooperation, because people understand each other easily, more easily. A reduced risk of conflict. So if you're talking about uh, team performance going down because a lot of conflict is happening, or we're going through the team building phases like storming and so on, in a homogeneous team, that happens differently than in a heterogeneous team. Yeah? But homogeneity and heterogeneity is based on or related to four different aspects, not just to the characteristics of the team, but also to the other, to the other stuff. This advantage of a homogeneous team may be less creative, maybe less optimal solutions as a result. That could be a disadvantage. In heterogeneous teams, we often see uh, as a disadvantage that we have more conflicts maybe longer discussions, and it's harder to find decisions. However, for certain aspects of the work, this is important. Yeah? We need to have these discussions. We need to have this conflict, especially if we are talking about innovation. Yeah? The advantages is, and the first one is uh, one I really like, the reduced assimilation tendencies. That means we don't have to become equal. 
in a homogeneous team, it's different. Yeah, we are already almost equal or similar in this team. So that means the tendency to assimilate if somebody comes in the team to make them equal is higher. Yeah? Gradient thinking is probably better in a heterogeneous team. So, going back to another experiment from the 50s now. Yeah, uh, it's becoming older and older the stuff I'm telling you. Yeah. <laughs> so this is an experiment of Mr. Libet, and he wanted to find uh, he did this experiment with these symbols. He created uh, uh, cards for teams with different symbols, and the team members had to find out uh, which of these symbols they have together in common, so on their cards. The purpose of this experiment was to find out how they communicate. Yeah about communication structures, what they use, how they communicate, uh, how they figure out uh, what they have in common. Why? Because we have in teams different communication structures. If you remember, I think seven slides back, I listed communication structures, one of the influences for team performance. And we have in general very basic ones, the wheel, the changer circuit, and this uh, network kind of structure. And we very often talk about centralized and decentralized networks. We tend to say that this is the best communication structure. Because everybody talks to everybody. Yeah. Especially in self-managed teams. We want to have this openness. We want to have this connection to each other. We want to interact with each other. But once again, centralized networks are better for simple tasks. So if we have to perform simple tasks and we allow all this complexity in the communication down here, that's not increasing our performance, that's not increasing efficiency or effectiveness. Decentralized networks are better for complex tasks. So once again, it's not good or bad, it's just for one purpose in one context, it's better to choose one or the other. And if you're working as Scrum Masters, we should also allow something like that to happen. I mean, you probably all have heard three minutes left. Yeah. I need another 30 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, we might be appropriate if we have emergent leadership in the group for certain situations that one person takes over, right? And that would be then such a communication structure. And leads probably to better and faster results than if we allow all this complex so, let's skip this one, um, also this one. No, the, um, we have for deep processes, and even if we have in individuals and in interactions over processes and tools, we still have team processes. Yeah? And one of the main aspects of that, one of the main variables is goal setting. Yeah? In Scrum, we have the sprint goal, one of the most underestimated tools we have in Scrum. Many teams don't use sprint goals. But it's so important. Uh, a goal is setting an objective or uh, an action, and it's creating team cohesiveness, for example. Yeah. Lockheed and Latham, the fathers of the goal setting theory, created a, a discipline in social psychology just for goal setting because it's such an important aspect for team building, for team performance, for team cohesiveness, for example. Um, they have said there are two main attributes of a goal, content and intensity. And intensity, for example, is related to the effort needed to set a goal, also to the commitment and the position of the goal in a person's hierarchy of goals. Yeah. The more important the goal is, the more motivated we are to work on that. And this sentence here, there is a relationship between the degree of goal difficulty and performance. It says that high uh, or difficult to achieve goals produce sometimes a performance of 250% higher than if people have to work on simple tasks, on simple goals. Yeah? Not always, once again. It's connected to all the factors I've already told you in the first 29 minutes. Yeah, I saw that. Thank you. But this is very interesting. And that's probably the topic for my next talk, which won't happen today. 
that may be really interesting for you in the next scrum gathering or next conference. The goal setting, setting theory, it's not just about the choice and direction, it's really about what, it, what happens to a team, what does it create. High performance, high goals, they are heavily connected. Uh, just can um, propose that if you're working as a Scrum Master, please go to the internet, search for Lockheed, Let and Goal Setting Theory. They have uh, written very nice books about that because this is really such an important tool Scrum Master should use to build a high performing team if this is required or just to create a team if it's not a team yet. And that was 30 minutes. Thank you. Do we have...